spend the next 20, 25 minutes to talk about API-driven uh, innovation. I actually started at WSO2 with the API manager product. That was the first product uh, I took care of uh, from a product management perspective. So it's, uh, uh, the whole API space is, uh, is dear to my heart. Um, and so before we start, I just wanted to set the stage on, on you know, what APIs are, I, I guess. So that, that before I do that, who has already published APIs either internally or externally to their internal systems? One, two, three, four, five, a few people, okay. Um, so th this is a trend that we see in, in pretty much every single customer. And the really goal of this chat is to discuss why this is a trend and, and what are the benefits are actually exposing APIs. So one of the key uh, things about APIs is really the innovation basically that those APIs bring. But why do they bring innovation? Um, so first of all, what is an API? It's really a business. This is something which is really important. We tend to attach API to be something very technical, like an interface that somebody can call. But really, what you're exposing with an API is either some data, some business process, so some information or that's really critical to your business. So it's really about exposing business functionality or data to consumers. Should those consumers be internal consumers, like within your enterprise, or outside of your, uh, of your enterprise uh, through some digital channel, let's say. In, um, in, in all the work that we have done with customers um, in, in the past four years now that this product has been out, the API Manager product has been out, and we started working with customers on, on API architectures, uh, one of the key characteristics that really made a difference between um, a successful API program and not a successful API program has been monitoring. Now, I'll go back on this but the uh, ability for you to understand basically what our API is doing and how they're called and are the patterns in which they are called will allow you to determine what's called by some analyst API value, which is, okay, I've exposed that functionality now. What is the value I'm getting from it and what are the value that the consumers are getting from it? Unless you instrument your system and you look from analytics, I'm back to my analytics speech from this morning, but part of that is uh, looking at the usage of those APIs, understanding which one are the most used, which one are not used at all, and why is that? Uh, maybe determining what are the key monetization you want to put around those APIs. One of the key aspects of APIs as well is, am I going to get people to pay for this? Uh, one way or another, either directly by calls or somehow behind the scenes another way. So what are some of the companies that have been doing this? Uh, some of them, I'm not saying those are all our customers. <laughs> One of them is, um, StubHub is. Um, so StubHub is actually our uh, most preeminent API management customer. They've actually gone through an entire transformation around APIs uh, at their company. So StubHub is pretty known in the UK, I think. You know, it's a marketplace for reselling tickets. It's very well known in the US. It's not everywhere in Europe yet, uh, but it's a, sub it's a division of eBay. And what I've been doing is really imposing either uh, at the same time internally to use the same APIs they're exposing to external partners uh, and, and to the public. You can go and create a mobile application and using the, the StubHub APIs to tap into their catalog of events and start reselling maybe some of the events that they have on their marketplace through your own mobile applications, for example. It's been, it has really helped them do a total transformation of their company in the way they are working um, in, in the sense that every, every functionality basically within uh, StubHub is exposed through those APIs. There's no other way to actually tap into this functionality than going through the APIs which are actually exposed. You know, Facebook is obvious, like all the applications and the way Facebook is working, is working through those, their own APIs. Stripe, you know, and, and uh, equivalent companies are revolutionizing the banking industry and forcing traditional banks to actually change. And, and one example here is Citibank. So Citibank is one of the most traditional banks you can think about. Uh, it's a 200 euros bank uh, that has gone through, uh, uh, it's a very interesting use case if you look at what they've been doing. Again, APIs are just, 
you know, the technical part of it, but the whole transformation they'd be doing around APIs and the innovation and doing hackathons and, and exposing something that would seem to be pretty, um, I would say, private data and sensitive data in terms of banking, you're normally are pretty, you know, close to their information and data. It's not something they really want to share. But they realize as a business, and, and that ties up to, to also what Nigel was saying this morning, that if they were not evolving and doing things differently, the stripes and the PayPals and all this innovation that was happening outside of the banking traditional industry was going to really hurt them. So it was really prey or predator. It was like do or die. Uh, if we don't change the way we're working, if we're not opening up and make it super easy to use any banking things, then we are going to have a problem as a business. It's like threatening uh, how we're going to evolve. Um, so just to give you a, a, a few e examples. Um, so. Now, what is important when you create APIs, right? I tend to say, oh, I think the, the tragic some after, uh, that the APIs are really the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> right? Um, what we see is, you know, creating APIs is what is going to allow internally and externally people to innovate on top of your data and your processes, right? But doing just the APIs is not enough. Uh, all the nice and, and principles in terms of architecture that we've learned along the way with SOA and services and everything, that's not gone, right? This is kind of orthogonal to the whole story. You still have to create services, or maybe microservices, with the, what uh, Asanka just presented. Uh, I'm not going to get into that debate now, but whatever you do, as Sanjeeva was mentioning this morning, you cannot buy services or microservices, right? You have to create and properly architect your in your system, define properly those services, the microservices, and then you're gonna expose those as APIs. If you if you create APIs as something you're gonna show to the outside world and straight on call, you know, JDBC code all the way to the back end and the database to show some data, pretty much what you're doing there is like a recipe for disaster in terms of architecture. Right, so whatever way you want to do it, if you want to start from the APIs and then implement the services, or start the services and exp expose them as API, doesn't matter, as long as you have a proper architecture in place, basically. That's really the critical part of all this. So what really open APIs and APIs have brought, is like, okay, so at a technical level, for a very long time, there was this thing saying, okay, what's the difference between a service and an API? Maybe there's some people still wondering, you know, Technically, what's the difference? Well, technically, there's not much difference, right? Technically, it's no difference. That's not where the difference is. The difference is in the management world. So when I'm, I'm talking about this to customers, I say, don't focus so much on the API word. Focus on the management word, right? And, and how easy it's going to be, basically, for somebody to consume the functionality that you're exposing. So one aspect of that is called self-service. Right, so uh, I'll tell you a story from, from a customer, um, some people I've talked to in, in Spain uh, some, some months ago, it was basically the, the engine behind um, something like booking.com or tales.com. So th those systems basically do not go directly and talk to the hotels and talk to all the systems to show you how you can reserve a hotel in whatever city in the world. There is those you know, hidden agencies behind the scenes basically, that does all this work for them, that really does the mass and goes to whatever, you know, uh, a, a hotel chain and say, we can negotiate 20,000 rooms with you across the board, and now we're going to resell them through those marketplace, basically. So those, those companies which are behind the scenes, the only way they will succeed, basically, they're not visible, they're not a customer thing, right? The only way to integrate with them is basically through APIs. Their survival, their business model is on making it very easy for some, the next booking to come to integrate with them and, and tap into their catalog of hotels, for example. They have a lot of APIs. Well they had, I think they simplify things a bit now. But their key problem was not to not have the APIs. They had all the APIs in the world to access all the information that they had. But it was taking something like between a month and two months for somebody to be on board 
to be able to call those APIs. I guess you had to call somebody, you had to kind of open a ticket, somebody had to approve you, it was taking forever. They didn't have the right SDKs, they didn't have any portal. So there was no self-service, right? They are evolving now, now you can go to their website and in like 10 minutes you'll get up and running with some API keys and you'll be able to call their APIs. That's the big change they've made from having APIs not manage and properly advertise to basically have managed APIs that they can uh, that uh, others can tap into. So the whole ease of use, um, the ability to do self-service, to have visibility into what's going on within the APIs, both on the provider side and consumer side. This is really what the management part gets into, right? So it is very. That's why it's so important for you if you want to expose APIs to put that management program in place. It's not on uh, not Sorry, it's not only about the technical side of it, which is to create API itself, but all the functionality and the ecosystem that you build around it is really the key part. So uh, around, you know, we've helped a lot of customers go through uh, this journey of creating APIs, and and out of this work, there's really something that comes out as the uh, recipe at a very high level for, for doing this. Well, the first thing, as I said, is you need the services part. So you first have to decompose all your services, your data, your processes as services, again, or microservices. Um, doesn't really matter what you have is some component that you can reuse. Um, and that's really the key part here from an architecture point of view, to have something that you can reuse and, and scale uh, automatically. So decompose that capability and then expose it as APIs. Um, you can switch those two if you want to go with an API first, basically, uh, methodology. So start with the API, with the interface, and then do the implementation. Both works. That's all. No fight. No problem. Then put this under control. Control. What control means really is this management part, right? So add the security on top of those APIs, add the management, add the SLAs, uh, so that you have you know basically what those APIs are doing, and you can in any point in time understand the value of your APIs. So collect all that data. So that data of the usage of the APIs is what is going to fuel basically the evolution of your program as well. If you don't understand how those APIs are actually being used by you and how, it's really hard to do the next step, which is the iteration, which is how do I enhance that now? Um, and enhancing can be the interface is not defined properly. Um, it can be the monetization is not defined properly. It's like too expensive or too low. I'm not making money out of this, right? It can be who are my best customers and what can I do for them? Um, so all this value is what you need to understand in order to enhance. And then one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing with API Manager, the, the next uh, release, not the immediate one, but the next one, this API composition that Sanjeeva talked about, is because this is really hard to get right from an IT perspective. So from an IT perspective, getting the interface right for any type of client, if you think about it, um, basically you have... Um, um, you are exposing some functionality, especially if you expose it externally, without any idea of how this data is going to be consumed. And it's, it's very difficult to you know, do the perfect API that's going to suit everybody, which is why this like, create your own and this composition is so important, so that um, you can actually, can I hear that noise from the microphone? Um, so, so that I can actually create my own API, either within the business uh, by composing multiple technical ones, like domain APIs, or as a consumer. So there's like the two use cases, right? Uh, one of the key issues we have in the industry today is the business and the IT move at very different paces. And if the business has to be very agile to respond on all the challenges that they have, IT is maybe a bit slower, and they need to be more agile. Uh, what this functionality allows you to do is to basically not want to have to wait on the other. The IT guys can just give the building bricks and the business side can just build their own API based on those building bricks and use this one instead of the basic ones. That's what this, we think this API composition is going to be so important uh, in this agility. And the next one is, is building an ecosystem, so we'll talk about this in a second. Um, so as I said, the APIs are really the tip of the iceberg, right? As you create a, an architecture around APIs, most likely you're going to end up with something like this. You'll have some services in the back end that we don't care what they're written with. They may have to be written with 
uh, our you know WSO2 app server. They may have been written with our framework for creating Java microservices in Java. They might have been written in PHP, in Node.js, whatever you please, or they could be something that you already have in there, or they could be um, something that you, you, you just start from scratch. You know, doesn't really matter. Um, most likely, you're going to have to compose or orchestrate those services to do some higher level um, uh, function. So let's say, you know, the typical reservation service, right? So the, the backend APIs will allow you to, will be the domain APIs allow you to manipulate a hotel, a car, you know, the base things. And uh, that composition layer here in the middle will allow you to create a higher level uh, service, which is basically a reservation that taps into those three. Right, so that's the composition layer. Orchestration is more about like things like business processes and long, uh, long running state processes, right? And then in front of that, you're going to put your API layer, which can very well go and tap directly into the services layer. It doesn't need to have a composite layer in front, or it's going to call those services um, that you have either composed or orchestrated. In front, the, this yellow you see in here is this is like the management layers where I engage those policies from security and access control, so I can make sure I have a, a access. Um, I basically control the access which is being made to the services and to the APIs. Especially, there's one thing. There's no laser on this, is it? Okay. Um, there's one thing which is really important as you build an architecture like this is to make sure that you prevent people from going straight into the service composition or service layer. If you're exposing things through a, uh, um, an API management layer, you really have to force people to go through that layer. Because if you don't, you're losing the control over how those APIs are actually used. Right? So the uh, advantage of putting that layer in there and having this unique entry point in your architecture is you can control everything from there, but then you have to really make sure nobody can just shortcut that layer and go straight to the back end. Um, and this is uh, then those APIs, as I said, the best what we've seen customers do is start with internal applications uh, that actually tap into those APIs. And they kind of build the API program this way. And then they expand to exposing some or all of those APIs to uh, third parties. Could it be partners uh, or public public, like completely open uh, to anybody? OK. Uh, so on top of that, what you're going to develop probably mobile applications, web applications, doesn't really matter. Um, the, the interfaces in there are really completely standard. That's the point. So that it makes it very easy for uh, users, whoever they are, the developers, to actually tap into those APIs, have a simpler programming model. Most of the time, there's going to be REST-based, and then you have a history of using SOAP and more complex maybe interfaces. But that interface here, just make sure it's like, um, as easy to consume as possible. Uh, as I always say to people, show some the developers some love, right? <laughs> the people you're going to give those APIs to, they'll have to consume them to create the applications. And they're on a stringent, usually, timetable. So they have some stuff to do, and they have some results to show. And if the APIs that you're providing are not really satisfactory, satisfactory to them, it's too, this is what this hotel uh, company problem was because they had a, a competitor that has pretty much the same platform, but they had a very uh, important API program and it was very easy to consume the APIs. So when people were coming to that other company and they were trying to tap into the APIs, because it was so difficult to onboard the system, they will just go to the competition. That was really their problem, right? So uh, people have no patience anymore. If they don't find very quickly the information that they want, the APIs that they want, they'll just go and go somewhere else. So if you want people to really onboard on your innovation and your ecosystem, you have to make the process of consuming as easy as possible. That's really critical. Right? Now, <laughs> I'll put this in because I get this question all the time. So I have you heard about, um, so this layer, basically, that I've shown here in the middle, what is it? Right? This composition orchestration. Is that an ESB? Is that not an ESB? This is really a logical picture, more than a, a, a physical one, right? And there is this movement right now in the market. As like for some, well, I I know a bit of the reasons. Um, like the word ESB is a bad word now. When you say ESB, it's like it's like almost an insult on the product. Um, and then the reason is like probably we've been abusing, and it's our fault as vendors. I used to work for IBM, uh, right? Again. 
this is all about not being religious about things, right? If you may need an ESB or not, okay? I had this discussion with a customer the other day, and he started saying, no, 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 we don't want an ESB, right? And then he was giving me the requirements of what they want, and I'm like, summing all the requirements, and I'm like, well, you may not want something that's called an ESB, but you certainly want something that does what an ESB does. You just don't want it to be called an ESB, that's all. Right, so it's really about the name, it's not about the functionality. So don't look at the name, look at the functionality. What is it that you need, right? And in some vendors, this will be called an ESB, in others, it will be called a gateway, in others, it will be called an integration bus. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is looking at the requirements and see what you need, right? And don't be religious about the name or not the name, that really doesn't matter. That's marketing, that's not functionality. Right, so don't discard ESB just because it's called an ESB or the functionality it has. Um, and and again, there's a blame on the on the industry on our side here for having pushed the ESBs as being SOA, which is very wrong. Right, uh, we used to, you know, I've I've been in meetings where people say, okay, so how do I start to build an SOA? Well, you buy an ESB. That's like the worst answer ever. Right, I if you want to have a proper architecture, you don't start with the product. You start with the architecture, and you start with the requirements, and then you put some names on top of what you need, right? But it's not because you have an ESB that you have an SOA. Again, you cannot buy services. You can only build them properly, and then you'll deploy it somewhere, okay? So this is really about, you know, think about it. Look at your requirements. If you need it, good. If you don't, no problem at all. That's fine, right? But just don't discard it because of that. And this goes a bit in that uh, term as well. Um, so right now there's a lot of hype around microservices and like suddenly everybody says, oh my God, you know, this is the way. So SOA was bad. Uh, now microservices are good. So I've been around for, unfortunately for me, maybe, <laughs> I've been around for about 25 years. I've been doing, if anybody in this room remembers Corba and IDL? Right? Okay. Does that remind you a bit? Right. So we went through this, the people are old enough, thank you, sir, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? We went through this. There's this thing called Corba and IDL, and it was all like object-based and the distributed system. And then we, we, we keep going in that loop, that circle, more than a loop, right, of things like going one way, coming back, going one way, more going back. So that's why we were very cautious, I think, in the rest of two as well when this hype comes out, because we've been there, right? So, okay, guys, okay, we, we signed that before. I've seen that 15 years ago. And I didn't go very far, and we had another idea, and we went another way, okay? So I, I was talking to uh, an analyst the other day, and he told me this, and I stole this phrase from him. that says, never judge a philosophy by its abuse, right? And he was saying every single SOA project that he knows that it has failed is because they were following the worst practices ever. Uh, and if you f have a bad API program, if you have a bad microservices design, Right? It doesn't matter if it's called microservices or SOA or whatever it is, it's going to fail too. Right? It's all about design. It's about best practices. That's really what I can recommend. So don't discard. There's tons of very, very good stuff that has been written and done in service architecture that you just have to tap on and make sure you don't do the same mistakes again with microservices, which for me is actually going to be worse because the microservices are a very smaller scope, which means there's more of it, so it's more distributed, and it's gonna be more complicated to actually manage if you don't do it properly. You can get in more trouble than you do with more coarse-grained services, I think. So you'll have to be very careful in all this, and yes, the, 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 the philosophy, not the philosophy, the, the, the domain has changed a bit, and there's much more things now as tools that we had, we didn't have like 15 years ago, but again, those are tools. Right, so so just think the architecture first, and then look at the look at the tools. I would say, so lesson learned from people who have gone through that that path of digital transformation through APIs. The first thing really is start small, right? So take this is a bit of philosophy of open source as well. When we create a product, um, you we first create like the core of the product, what you call an MVP. And, and we just look at creating that, making that work, and then grow around it. If you start by trying to do the entire thing in one block, that's not going to work, right? It's more difficult to do. So if you start small, but end-to-end, -end, that's really the key kill thing, right? So find some data and business process you want to expose, 
create the APIs in front, manage them, create the applications that use them, show the usage, put that in beta, do some hackathons, make it work. And once this is, you know, you, you got it working, you see some value, and you can sell that value to the business, which is very important, then you can go and grow that program and do more, right? So don't, don't try to just expose your entire company as APIs at first. Just go and, and do, s you know, small things. Because the, the APIs are really, as I said, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of cultural change that need to happen, a lot of resistance in digital transformation uh, of a company where the technology really is just a little bit of it. The culture and, and, and you know, it is also a very important part that you have to look at. And selling to the, the business is very important. Um, I've done, I've, I've said mo most of this, I think, pretty much. So measure the API value so you can prove that there is value. That's one one of the worst practices, I think, of SOA. We haven't really tapped on the way on how to show the value of reuse. You know, that that was the promise that like you would do services and magically they will be reused. That's not happening this way. But you have to build the right ecosystem around it to actually make them being reused. And that's why the business buying is also very important. So they can buy and, and into understanding that if those APIs exist, there's some business innovation they can do that they couldn't do if those APIs do not exist, right? That's what you have to show them. Um, so th this advertise and sell in that place is really important because it's not only about creating, again, the technical part of it. It's about how you're going to sell that internally uh, to, your, to your customers. It's something we've done with multiple customers, for example where we create the APIs and we'll just participate in some internal hackathon with the customer where their own developers come and basically start writing applications on top of the APIs that have been written. So it, it might be a cultural change. Don't underestimate that in terms of the adoption of the transformation. And, and build an ecosystem. So again, you know, make sure that the consumers and the providers of the APIs can actually talk to each other, exchange, you can create a community around the APIs where people can uh, basically talk about the APIs and get them to evolve so they buy in into uh, the, the API program, basically. And, and this is another thing that most of our customers have done is start internally, use that internally. And once you have done that internally, then start expanding externally, right? This is what StubHub has been doing, for example. Right? But it's also very important that the internally, the same APIs, I think if you can do that, are used internally, the exact same interface is used internally and externally in order to drive the, the right innovation. Okay, and, and finally, this is not magic, right? <laughs> it's not, uh, again, it's not because you're going to create APIs and magically everybody's going to come and innovate. You will have to do what I, I mentioned before and build that ecosystem and sell that program internally. Um, and then, you know, um, hopefully you can benefit within your company uh, of, you know, all these companies I talked about before have benefited from. Thank you very much for your...